So what I, what I discovered there is that I wanted to be a client-free firm. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running and managing an, a small architectural practice that lets you do your best work more often. Today I'm joined by Matias Daroch, and it is a pleasure to have Matias on the line today. Before we get into a little bit about Matias and introduction, I want to remind you if you haven't already signed up to view our free 60 minute firm owner masterclass, head on over to smartpracticemethod.com and discover the framework and the method that business of architects that we've developed over the past 10 years to help you run a practice that lets you live your best life. And now a word from our sponsor, RCAT. Hey, Architect Nation, since you're a podcast listener, I know that you're always looking to fill up your empty space in your day with valuable ways to sharpen your sword as an architect or sharpen the saw, as Stephen R. Covey said. I wanted to tell you about Detailed, which is a podcast series run by RCAT that features architects, engineers, builders, and manufacturers where they share their insight and expertise as they highlight complex, interesting, and odd building conditions that they've encountered and the ingenuity it took to solve them. It's hosted by Sharice Lakeside, otherwise known as CSI Kraken, who's a senior specification writer, RDH Building Science. She uncovers lessons learned to help you navigate similar challenges that may arise in your projects. You can listen now by heading over to rcat.com forward slash podcast. That's A-R-C-A-T dot com forward slash podcast or search your favorite podcast app for detailed by rcat matthias daroch is the principal of mik architecture he's been in his client's shoes and therefore takes the time to really understand every client's individual needs and i'll tell you what that means as a chilean architect he landed in miami to lead his family's real estate developments realizing very soon that he would be better served if he became a registered architect himself Fast forward a few years, Matias became a registered architect and founded MIK Architecture in January of 2020, so just right before COVID, to serve not only his family's business, but also a handful of of starting real estate developers and investors. So today, they work with developers and investors who want to design modern or contemporary style residential architecture in South Florida. Matias, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thank you so much for having me. Great to have you here. And we'll also mention is that you have been working with us in the Smart Practice Program for just over two years now. It's been two years? That is right. It's been two years and starting my third year now. Yeah, beautiful. Very happy. Well, let's... Absolutely. Well, hey, let's take it back. So that that's a you have a very interesting history coming from Chile, moving to South Florida. Uh, As mentioned in the in the intro here, you were you came up here to coordinate and help manage your family's real estate investments in the States. And then you realize that, hey, it would be, you'd be better served if you could uh, actually start doing the drawings. So first of all, let's, let's rewind because moving, like moving from one country to another is a big deal, right? So tell me a little bit about that. What was that like for you to go from Chile? Had you lived in the United States before? Was this the first time you'd moved here? Give me the some background on that. Sure. I mean, just like very, very going very back, I actually grew up until seven years in Miami. So I was born in, in Chile, in Santiago. Three months later, they, as soon as they could, uh, travel in the plane. We landed in Miami for my dad's work, and we left when I was seven years old. So I had like a big uh, the backgrounds there, stepping stone, you could say it. Um, I actually learned English before Spanish, and then I lost English, and then I came back with English, but never mind. Um, so I always had this connection with Miami. I came every so often, and that, and then eventually an opportunity came through, and I just took it, and I got married <laughs> and came to the U.S. So everything was completely new when I came in here. It was very exciting. Um, I had to learn a new system, you know, metric. Let me interrupt you right here, Matthias. So you were so you were in Chile, and were you working at the time? What was your professional um, status at the time when you moved to to South Florida? I I in Chile I got uh, I I left you know I finished school, uh, uh, university. And I also founded my own business there, my firm, with uh, one of my classmates. And we managed to work two years and as, a, as a firm. We started with small things there, 
um, mostly renovations and legalizations, you could say, um, all of them houses. And, and eventually, the, the reason we came to the U.S. is a friend of my dad, who, is, who I work today um, side by side, um, was already working a lot of time in, in the U.S. for 10 years already. And, and my dad had some money set aside and he wanted to you know, move this around. So that's why I came in to like to be part of it and learn from the whole thing. And what was so you had you had a practice down there. What was that? What were, what kind of feelings and thoughts were going through your head when you're looking at leaving something that you'd spent two years working on and then moving to this opportunity in Florida? What was that like for you? Um, it it wasn't hard. Actually, uh, it was different. I I kept in touch for a, a few years, trying to manage some works over there that I, I left uh, pending. Um, but I've always had this entrepreneur spirit, and my wife's too. My wife also had her own business in, in Chile, and what did we she both, do? You know, she's a nutritionist, um, and over there she had her own uh, like consulting firm uh and she also teaches but and <laughs> it's called Nutreduca and uh and uh, well she left it behind it was a bit more harder at the time it wasn't that easy to have consultants you know zoom meetings or whatever um but she retook it last year actually when when my son uh when he was 6 months old he started eating and she she started she pivoted her her business to um, infants' food, solid foods, introductions to foods. Um, anyways, we both have always been the support to each other in our in in entrepreneur uh, spirit and mind, and that's amazing. So it wasn't that hard actually to come, leave that behind. Um, not completely. I still had my partner, but eventually it faded away. Uh, it just stopped. Uh, being involved in the day-to-day -day business over there and and more in the day-to-day -day business over here, like, especially when I started to study to get the degree back, uh, the U.S. degree registration. And so when you moved to Miami, what was your day-to-day -day responsibilities in that first opportunity that brought you here? At the beginning, very beginning, I was basically another draftman. <laughs> Mm -hmm. An architecture draftman. I, I really had to. It took me, I, th I think, a month or two months to uh, understand the imperial system, but like completely, right? And mm. there was one thing that someone told me: don't translate it. Don't like say, okay, three meters is this or one meter is that. Just learn it from scratch. So I spent a week. I remember with a measuring tape with this fractions things and decimal thing that I didn't understand measuring the world the whole office the cars the structures the, the building the windows whatever I could find I measured and started understanding it and then um, and then you know with time drawing that and and putting it together so yeah that was the first day-to-day -day stuff and then uh, when I started learning I started shadowing people that I, I that were already in the real estate business and um, you know going to meetings with the cities and and people to 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 buy help I, mean, I didn't even know how to buy a lot at that moment so I had to shadow a lot of people um, and eventually I took a leap you know bought something here small uh, learned a lot in the process uh, then try to get the permits so I had I had help from another architect that was in the same building as we are, um, who eventually also helped me with the uh, with the registration, and um, he helped me you know draw the plans, notes here and there, and I had to go and expedite the permits you would say. Uh, so being on top of the city officials and responding to comments and understanding what the hell they were asking for, all that learning curve was pretty amazing and so every day was different and for for the first two years i would say it was like a three months or a four month period of, of changing my roles and 
I would say up to till today. I mean, still do that. I mean, I I like to understand what the task is, do it the first time, and then teach someone to how how I think it's the best way, and if they can get a better way, that's um, even better. But I like to know what I'm doing and or what the office is doing in general, and in, in every task and every role. Um, so anytime there's something new, like for instance the AI AI stuff. <laughs> Mm. Uh, I'm learning that now and eventually I want to pass it along to someone on my team but I, I want to learn it first mm, mm, beautiful so what year was it that you came here to the States the first time well the, when you moved to Miami I moved 2016 okay so 2016 so it was a four year there's a four year time period you moved here so you were doing kind of draftsman level work, learning the imperial system. One of the things that I love about these interviews, Matthias, is as we talk to people and look at uh, the success that they've had, you've been very successful in the smart practice program. And oftentimes, you know, after having done hundreds of these interviews, it's typically it's not the big things that I look for that I can say, okay, that's why the person's successful. But oftentimes it's the little clues. And so what, what I did notice is the way you approached learning the imperial system is telling. To me, it says something about your personality, about how you approach things. The fact that you were very methodical about it, the fact that you took it on fully, that you you got a measuring tape out, and then you actually, one round, you measured everything. Like, that's that's abnormal, man. You're a crazy person. <laughs> crazy. <laughs> you, crazy in a good way, in a, in a crazy entrepreneurial way, right? So, um, and and as we move into this interview, I want our listeners to pay attention to these little things, right? These little things. Oftentimes, it's as we look for building the architectural practice we want to build, the business we want to build, the family we want to build, it's going to come down to the little things about how we approach life, our, our work habits, how we think through problems. So I thought that was, that was fantastic. So you learned, you learned what five-eighths is. Right, yeah. I mean, Which makes fractions. completely no sense. And you understood... <laughs> that it's 6.25 inches and fantastic. Great. You learned an eighth and <laughs> you're like, why do Americans do this? I don't understand why they use this imperial system. Did you ever figure <laughs> out why, what, why, what's the advantage? Which one do you like better having done both now? That's a great question. Um, I, because the way I learned it, I think they're very different and it's very hard to me to like say, I, I mean, I know a meter is approximately three feet, but that's about it. Ten meters, mm -hmm. uh, whatever. Um, but there's there's something good about the imperial system that I like a lot is that it's you know an inch, a two inches, three inches, four inches. You go by you know by that. Uh, it's like a uh, how do you call it? A break point. It's modular. It's modular. So you know it's modular. Yeah. Little modules. All right, yeah. The, the, the metric system is very easy to understand. 100 centimeters is one meter. That's it, you know. But then you get things like, I don't know, it's a, we need a 94 centimeter door or 93, whatever. And it's just 32, 12, 24, whatever, whatever. Uh, so I think it's easier to to memorize those breaking points, I would call it, like standard measurements and then the metric system we, we still have them but it's uh it, it gives you more flexibility so sometimes it's not that standard i know it's like sometimes 90 centimeters a year two meters for the doors or that sort of stuff is easy but um and it has that the, the imperial also has that you know hey if i understand it then i'm cool sort of thing <laughs> mm -hmm. while the metric system everyone understands it everywhere so it's kind mm -hmm. of weird. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I'm not sure I, I answered your, your question, but... <laughs> no, that's, that's great. I, that makes a lot of sense. I know when I worked in Panama, of course, we used the, the, the metric system down there. So it, it was. I do get what you're saying. And um, I do like how the imperial system is basically it's divided up. So you have a hole that's divided up, divided up. And of course, it's on. it's a base 12 system as opposed to base 10 system, which is... It's just right. interesting to experience those two, you know, kind of base 12 versus base 10, so... And, and, and in a way, I think, like, hey, how much separation do you need for uh, the door between the door and the, and the wall for, to say something? For the casing, I know it's going to be three and a half inches is the best approach. And in, in the metric, it yeah. will be between 10, 8, or 9, I don't know. I just yeah. say 
yeah. one number in, in the pearl. I think yeah. that's 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 pretty nice. Yeah, and it's nice. Yeah, yeah, and the building typical building material size is like two by four. It's great. Okay, so there's a little bit of building science for our listeners. Something we don't typically talk about here on the podcast. But so you were here for four years. Um, decided to so you're doing architecture. Decided to launch your own firm. Decided to get get licensed. And then for you, so you had a bit of help launching your firm, meaning you had clients because you had family projects you're working on, and you built some relationship with developers. So you had you had some work coming in. Was there any nervousness, fear, or worry, or anxiety about actually starting a practice for you, or did it feel pretty safe? Um, well, of course, there's always some nervousness, uh, but I was very excited at the beginning and was very lean also, so I was I felt safe. I mean, the the project we were gonna come, I w- I was. I wasn't waiting for any projects to come in. I already had the projects when I started. They were just waiting me to get the license and the signature to to submit them, basically. Um, so it was pretty safe in that end. However, I also realized that I didn't have much experience on the business part. Hiring people or managing um, time or I, I had some experience building, of course, but there were like some little intricacies that I learned that I didn't know, and that got me okay. You know what? I I'm gonna need a couple of uh, I'm gonna need help here, and and the people that I I, I work with uh, had some experience, but I really wanted to see the today's approach kind of way. If that makes sense, you know. Yeah, for you, what is what is today's approach? Like when you say that, what does that mean for you? A work-life balance, basically. Um, that's a summary, a good summary of it. A work-life balance, yeah. having time with family. I would say that before, and I didn't experience it that much because I've always been in, I never had a boss. <laughs> uh, only clients that I would call bosses, but I never really had a boss. Um and before, I would say, and even some firms today, you know, the, the old method way, you just have to work nonstop from 8 to 6, 8 to 7 or whatever at the beginning. Maybe later when you're higher up the ranks, you can get some slack off. But uh, I didn't want that. I didn't want to get, create that culture if, if, if I had to. And at the beginning, it was just me. I didn't have anyone. But I knew that at some point, I had to start building a team. And I didn't want that to happen. I've got, you could say that I got bored of staying up late night in school. One thing that I hated was staying up all night. <laughs> so oh, it was I like my... I hated all-nighters. I, I hated that with a passion. Oh, the yeah. worst. Yeah. yeah I, I, so I can do it. I just hate them. So I, I hate them so much that I want to plan so it doesn't happen to me. You know, mm, and, and I guess that was my my today's approach, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. So 2020, you know, great year to start a practice. You know, 2020 vision. It's a great number. Of course, we know three months into 2020, <laughs> boom, world starts shutting down. COVID, you know, becomes this major thing. Of course, Florida is less reactive and they keep things open for longer. They're a lot more flexible about that. And at the same time, you have a baby coming, first child, right? That uh, so you well, had a lot going no, on there when you started the, the practice. Yes, yes, we had plans, but um, baby came a few months later, within COVID. Um, yeah, actually a year later, twenty twenty one. But okay. uh, yeah, it was. I think it caught me at the right moment. Um, we had the right projects. It was just me. And because we we're inside the house all day, I had more time too. Um, so I really think it was, I, had, I was lucky in that sense. If, I, if it would have caught me later on with a bit more of a bigger team, I think I would have suffered a bit more. Um, but it was, and the other part is that we had our own projects going. We suffered with the projects, I would admit that. It was a lot slower to build, 
spot. So even if everything was open, uh, construction world, um, it was a lot slower. I mean, supplies, materials, people coming, um, the getting sick, and that delayed something, and then someone else got sick, and they had that delayed another. So uh, instead of building a house, a small house, in eight months, it took us a year and a half to twice. So in that sense, um, it, it was it was a, a challenge, but um, I also joined um, an, another coaching before business of architecture, and it helped me with the marketing part. And then I learned there, and I built so many systems in that time, during that period of of, of having time. Uh, not only because there was less work, but also because I was more in the, in the house and you had, you know, instead of working from 9 to 5, 9 to 6 or whatever, I could work until 8 and nothing would, would happen. Uh, so I built a lot, like, a lot of systems there, a lot of things like organizing the, the firm, um, putting standards, things that I had to do from scratch because it was just a new firm. Um, so it was fun. <laughs> in the end, it was fun. <laughs> Challenging but Very cool. So you enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, I know a lot of a lot of firm owners. So typically, when people are are young and they start their own practices, there's a couple of reasons why we do that. Uh, the first one is we're looking for more freedom. The second one is we're looking for more growth. We may feel like we've kind of reached a plateau where we're at. And the third one is, you know, we have this idea that we could earn more money if we're working for ourselves. So what I'd like to know from you is, you know, you've been doing this for a bit now, three years, going on three years. Um, how how are those things line up for you in that first year? The more money, more time, freedom, and um, you know, ability to grow. Ability to grow for sure. Uh, in that time period, since we we started to now, <laughs> started with one person, just me. We are six today. Uh, five mm-hmm. architects and one administrative person that helps me out. So yeah, ability to grow, it's been great. And and I wait I mean I and for that same reason I have more time too. Well it's a balance of course, but um I've leveraged my time much better also. Um so my, my I call them project managers or job captains or um people that are in charge of the projects on the architectural side. They are amazing and, and they once they already grab the hand of it uh, of what things have, how I like to do them, or we as the office, we, uh, at the end, it, it, it saves me so much time, you know, redlining or whatever. And ability to, to earn more? Well, because we're a developer focused firm and we like to develop, and part of our mission is to be client free, we're investing a lot too, me personally, uh, with other partners on the development side. So I would say that it's going to come eventually. It's not here yet. I'm not. I'm not concerned, but uh, about money at all. But uh, I haven't. I, I'm not. I'm not like looking for it right now. So I'm just trying to grow that portfolio, trying to grow that uh, investments and 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 the cash flow. You know, we need them. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, so personal cash flow right now isn't your primary consideration because you recognize that you're putting a lot of that cash flow back into the development projects that are going to grow and appreciate over time. Exactly, exactly. And and, and it's like a snowball, you know, it starts growing and growing and growing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. At least that's the idea. <laughs> Absolutely. It's going to take off. It's become the, the real estate baron of Miami. Yeah, and, and then Florida. it's a, a, vicious, a vicious cycle, you know. It's, it starts growing that and then I can... That I get a bit more, and then that means I can bring better projects, and and you know, wow, the future looks amazing. <laughs> yeah, let's let's walk through where um, when you reached out to me, and uh, and then you joined Smart Practice. Um, where what were you dealing with at that time that that made you want to reach out? Let's let's get a quick little checkup of like where were you at back then, um, in terms of why you reached out to us. Wow, that was a while ago. Let me see if I remember. I know. You're going to have to think <laughs> back a little bit here. Yeah, let's take a second. Take a second. Let's um, think about it. Yeah, so I was, I had finished this other coaching I mentioned, the mark, the, helped me with the marketing part. 
Um, but then I realized that I didn't need only marketing um, because I had this projects coming to me, that part of the developer, friends, whatever. Nope. I had some of them. I realized that in that time, I remember that uh, baby was coming. It was announced already. We, we were we were there, and um, and I also realized that I needed to start growing to have more time for family, and 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 that was important for me at that time. And I knew it wasn't going to be a fast track or a, a fast task. You would you could say it. So I had to start early, and and yeah, I mean that's why I joined uh, the smart practice. I, and I understood uh, the values have, of having help with a business, so that I could have my freedom later and, and yeah. with a family. And so you found you found that you were working a lot. Everything was on you. You were wearing a lot of hats, and you knew that you wanted to build a business that allowed you to actually have freedom within the business. Exactly. That was it. The, the, were you working a lot when you came to us? Yes. Did you have yeah, that work-life so balance or you, were you working a lot? What was that like? So with COVID, because of, like I mentioned before, we had so much time and, and, and we worked a lot because we were in... The, and I would say that you work a lot more in how, um, when you're at home than when you're at the office because you never stop. I started... I recognized that that habit that became a habit that I had to break. So I was working a lot and then projects started reactivating and then more that me, that would mean that I would have to work more and and because it was just me, uh, eventually I I started failing deadlines. My production side wasn't enough to hold to to deliver. Um so yes, I would say I was working way too much at the time and Knowing that the baby was coming and and my wife pregnant was needing more help already, um, I was in a crossroad. <laughs> I would say. Yeah, I'll say. Okay, so you had this impending: the baby's going to be born. You're realizing you need more time to spend with your your wife and the family, and at the same time, the business has a lot of demands right now because you started up and you're the one doing everything. So you came on board at this time. You jumped into smart practice with both feet. It was incredible. Uh, you took off quickly. And then what have been some of the the major kind of in those early days, what were some of the most useful and valuable things that you discovered for you about running a smart practice? The first 12 weeks of defining the goals, personal goals and the firm goals and the framework out of it was my breakthrough, My definitely my breakthrough. I, I wasn't sure about, about that. My, Why was that a breakthrough? Um, so what I, what I discovered there is that I wanted to be a client free firm. And mm -hmm. what does that mean clear for about us? That. I got, I got clear. I didn't know about it. I mean, I, in my mind I knew, but I didn't have it in words. And, and that has defined everything we do today and what projects we pick and, and basically, you know, even what people work with us. I mean, um, and why, why was it so, what it means for us is that we basically want to develop and work on our, on our own development projects. That's basically it. So we don't have to worry about clients later. We're still going to have, you know, some investors here and there, but, um, that's the goal. And, uh, yeah, that's about it. Okay. Okay. Beautiful. All right. Now, and tell me about the leap to hire. So it's it's no small feat to to have a firm of six people. Before we jump into that question, what what did you find as you've grown your your practice, Matthias? What have been the most challenging parts for you that you've discovered? I would say I'm a bit of a control freak, and um, one of the biggest challenges was to confide in someone that what they were what I was gonna asked him for was going to be as good as I would have done it and on a time that you know was reasonable for what I thought it was understanding that 80 percent if, if you delegate to someone that's going to do it 80 percent as, as you're going to do it eventually 
you know, in, in, in a medium time frame. That was another mind-changing thing for me because it liberates so much time for me, even if the other person takes twice and does it at 80% as good as I could do it, it it's still good enough and they can get, keep getting better. Um, that was one of the biggest challenges to for me to understand and and knowing that that's going to help me and the business more than if I do it all and wearing all the hats. Um, and then we have both things, you know, I'm, 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 I'm very devoted to one, to grabbing things and doing it right and, and try to do it the best way possible. I also take too much time on it. I'm, I like focus too much in, in one thing and it could give a lot of, uh, <laughs> I could use a lot of time on it on the architectural side. And believe it or not, I like reading codes. I like reading um rules and and you know sony codes and the uh, ibc i like to understand it i i like to really imagine how we can turn it around i love it um and i also love books i like numbers weird guy i know <laughs> so the other part was the other challenge was to delegate that book keeping stuff that i had it so tidy so clean and I knew once I gave it to someone it's not it wasn't gonna be as clean. But I had to do it eventually. I mean yeah. already my administrative yeah. person is there. She's still she's amazing at it now. And <laughs> and it's been it's been amazing. The codes part, I still don't delegate that. <laughs> This uh well this is this is a challenge of running a business as a small business is that uh you know we're 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 very capable at what we do. We're usually like very very good at it, and uh, it's it's challenging. We want to do everything ourselves. It seems like no one else can do it as good as we can do it. It's really challenging to let go. It's very very challenging to let go, right? And just let other people do stuff and and allow them to fail. Allow them to not succeed. Obviously, we don't want to give them so much responsibility that they crash and burn and it costs us a lot. But we need to be we need to be open to the fact that they're going to make mistakes or do things not the way that we do them. Otherwise, we're going to be trapped always just being the sole practitioner, just being the person who's has wearing all the hats because we're not willing to let go. What was it, Matthias? What was it in your mind that allowed you to to let go, to take that step, to let go of those things and start to trust other people and and give them that responsibility, delegate what? that to them. What was in my mind or who was in my mind? <laughs> I kind of want to know. I want to know what was the what was that what was the switch? What was the switch that kind of went off where you're like, okay, I got to let this go. How did you overcome that reluctance uh to to let go? Oh, that's a great question. Um I think the training with the smart practice was 80% of it. <laughs> uh Either it wasn't like a one session or workshop or one week, you know. It was like a, the the time and repeating of it and sm- slowly understanding and getting there. That was most of it, and then eventually talking to my wife, talking to coworkers, talking to people, reading books. Uh, one thing that I love about the smart practice that I don't know if it's. 100% of the intention of the smart practice, but I grabbed the reading habit back. I I had completely stopped reading books for lots of years, and now I read or hear actually in Audible um, a book a month. So it's it's been amazing, and um, and that also helps me understand. You know, all of that gives you it's like a, a small voice in your head that tells you, you know what you're just doing, just do it. <laughs> see what's the worst that could happen you know well there's a lot of bad things that could happen <laughs> exactly now, let's face but, it when you when you bring on an employee you're looking at spending anywhere from 80 to a hundred thousand dollars or more uh, that's that's a substantial commitment in terms of so it's difficult it's difficult taking those first steps to hire and did you have any any missteps did you make any mistakes when you first hired for instance hiring people that were really cheap and then and then finding that you ended up doing more work. What was your experience with those initial hires? 
Um, well, my initial hires were my initial hires were all. Uh, I got lucky, <laughs> I would say, because they were they were someone that's someone new. So I I got to were good referrals basically, um, and. I wouldn't miss, miss steps. Let's see. I would say that it was more in my mindset that I may I try to explain what we do and the culture of it and all. But I think in my mindset I told them more or I explained them better that they what they actually understood. Um, so all that you know the onboarding process uh, can have a bit more. Exhaustive in my side and more, not more exhaustive, sorry, more extensive or more delayed maybe because everything, throwing everything at, at once to one person that's just coming in uh, doesn't help to anyone. Uh, so I, I said, okay, I told him everything. He already, it's like in my mind they were recording and, and it's not like that, you know. So um, that was one thing. And then, and then I expected them to know everything. And that was like one misstep, I would say. Um, then hiring, I we I hired someone that was fresh off university. Uh, it was he was great, but <laughs> I had to teach him a lot too. And I didn't realize that until until it was the moment. Um, I still think we should all have that part of the education of the firm you know today getting out of the university even myself I didn't knew much once I left especially business side or the practical side um, so it's part of our responsibility still to to train and coach them and teach them like the real architecture I would say uh, but I was expecting someone that already knew and I didn't realize that uh, I still he has so much to go through yet. That was a challenge there because my my planning and my timing planning was a bit different, basically. Yeah, and how did that impact things, having someone that requires so much training? It took more time for me. Um, in a way, it helped me because uh, I trained them the way I... I Sort of molded them the way I the firm was going to, or, or the the way we were looking to do things. But it did take more time than I expected for me, and and I didn't have much of the networking sense in that moment. So it was my excuse also to not try to sell more uh, or look for more prospects, uh, but to train him better and do better production. I think it was more. Mm -hmm. I was also more comfortable doing that at the moment than than looking for more prospects. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. And what would you say? What was the cost of that of that extra time that you had to spend training that person? What did that cost you? Good question. Um, I don't have a number really. I should take them. <laughs> what do you? Yeah. What do maybe, you think? I'm, either, maybe I'm either. fearful of that number. Yeah. Twenty thousand, thirty thousand dollars. Probably so there's, there's like, a financial cost yeah. to it. And what's that financial cost from? Like you being pulled off of other projects you could have been working on, networking opportunities. Where does that where does that cost come from? Um, I think a bit of, of everything. Uh, not only my time, but his time too, or whoever's mm -hmm. time it is. Mm -hmm. I'm trying. I mean, it's great for them, but it is a cost for the office. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. my time, because an hour I, I spend teaching, it's also an hour of them hearing. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, you could think they're not robots and all, and that, of course, are not, you know. But it's, it's if you add up all the hours that it, they've been educating, which I love, which is great, but, at the, you know, there's some, like, basics that could be, I mean, it's, it's part of the cost. You should not, I should have known at the moment. Yeah. If I would have well, known, for, for, I, for a firm I would have like yours, accordingly. Or yeah, for I was for a firm like yours, what's the cost of like twenty or thirty thousand dollars? Like, what impact does that have on the firm not having that? 
it's a big impact. <laughs> yeah, like tell me what. Especially What's the impact? Uh, today, it's a it's a good portion of what could be a profit that would go into a, a developer project, a development project. Mm-hmm. We could either mm-hmm. defer our fees with that fee with that amount, and we would get an interest on on top of that, mm-hmm. and uh, we could it could also help us, um, you know being part of a project instead of being the providers of it um it could i mean it's it's a stepping stone for anything basically i mean mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah i wouldn't say i could hire anyone today for that amount but um it would help me for example uh spend more time prospecting definitely I mean, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and you could probably hire someone, and that might that would pay the first couple, first one or two months of their of their employment, right? And then they can become profitable, and and they continue to grow. Oh yeah, in, in that sense, yes, yes, yeah. In that sense, yep. yes. no. Today, coming from Chile, I have a lot of options to hire remote workers too, from the production yeah. side. Uh, my admin team is uh, is in Chile. And I have one of the project managers in Sweden and it's been working great. So Yeah. That yeah, helps. that's amazing. That's amazing. Um it, it is interesting that, you know, oftentimes as small firm owners, we're often thinking and we see this with the majority of small firm owners, where it is it's when we're hiring, a lot of times it's short term thinking. In other words, I'm going to hire this person because they're I'm gonna go for this level of person because they're cheap. I'm gonna hire someone new because I'll have to pay Five thousand, six thousand dollars a month, as opposed to a more experienced person who might cost me eight thousand or ten thousand dollars a month, right? And we're just focused on that initial outlay, but we're blind to the cost, the opportunity cost. Like I remember learning. Did you ever learn about that in economics? I remember when I went to yes. economics, they yes. taught us there's a cost <laughs> to everything. There's the cost that you actually pay, but then there's the opportunity cost of what you could have earned if you would have done something different. And for small firms, oftentimes that cost is huge, 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 huge. Yeah, I mean, the I I would say today um, it's much easier for me for me to calculate that. Like if I had to de- make a decision today, because mm-hmm. I understand better my metrics and my KPIs, you know. What's At a the KPI time, for those who that's don't why know? I was. The key performance indicate indicators of the firm. And what is a key performance indicator? And well, it's it's the 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 numbers and benchmarks to to tell you that tells me at least uh, how am I doing in certain areas of the firm that could be profits and or it could be prospects and lead sources and. It also means uh, how much, uh, uh, I don't know, how much I'm spending in consultants, for example, or profit per project. Um, I have a couple of there that keeps me on my toes. So I know when I have to yeah, push yeah, yeah. more into one side or the other. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like having a, um, like a dashboard in a car, right? So you have the dashboard that, that shows you yeah. your speed, it shows you your oil, it shows you... Uh, your velocity, well, it, speed and velocity, I guess, would be similar in a car. It's going to show you your fuel tank level, your odometer. But it gives you the ability to, like you said, it gives you feedback for how you're doing. So you can make adjustments. And, and yeah, you can make adjustments and, and, and see what should be your, you know, hey. Yeah, well, making, making adjustments. And for you, what has been, uh, just in terms of leading people, what has been the most difficult part? Has it been uh, holding them to account, uh, their quality of their work? Um, has it been the team culture or something else? Um, I would say it is communication. Yeah, tell me about From that. From me to them. Just have enough time to communicate clearly or what? I, yeah, um, I would say that w- that is one definitely, uh, absolutely uh, having time to communicate clearly in the sense of what's going on with the projects and trying to uh, because when you're an owner of the firm, you you have like a big overview of everything, 
but you forget that sometimes your team doesn't. So you start talking to them and they just get lost and you know, 20 minutes later you understand why they're lost because they forgot, I forgot to mention one key piece of information of it. And, and it's not only the time to communicate but is like the process of communication and bringing down the information down to the team that for me it's been the most challenging part and, and, and that I have to do consciously. I think that's, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just assume everyone knows everything all the time and been tanned. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. And how does that impact the firm, the communication challenges? Do you see? Um, I would say that um, sometimes, very few times, thankfully, uh, we've done the work the, twice. Um, which is, of course, I hate. Mm -hmm. I hate when we have to do twice anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other part is uh, focusing on the priorities of what project should go first or what should we deliver first, um, like organizing the project schedules and understanding what is missing or what is being asked for in the construction site, for example. That's always like the typical fire putting tasks, but that doesn't mean that we can step over something that we're due in, I don't know, some time. And if we don't get to that, then we're going to delay the whole project for another month, you know? So that project management, I would say, is, is what affects most the firm when that communication isn't brought down to the team completely. Because they also help, you know, they, it's not like I have to have everything in my mind. Um, they help and say, oh, great. So because they know a bit of everything, just like me, they can start deciding, okay, I'm just going to finish here and then go there and they don't have to come back to me and ask me what's next. You know, I want to avoid that. That's one of my uh, key features, um, key things that I want to avoid is that they have to come back to me. Hey, what do I have to do now? I hate it. <laughs> And the only way to do that, I would say, is them understanding what's next and communicating to them uh, next steps. Not even next Mati steps, you know, like broadly. Yeah, Matthias, the, the Sorry, work you do ahead. right now, it's very cool. Uh, you have a you have a contemporary flair that you do um, with the, the designs that you're doing, very cutting edge. You know, playing a lot with like indoor outdoor spaces, like lots of expansive glass you know, big, big open spaces, just lots of natural light. I mean, just beautiful, beautiful designs. How do you, um, have you ever come across the the challenge of having a client want something that you just, you know, as an architect, you're like, that's terrible. And then how do you have that conversation or does that not happen to you? Oh, yes, it has. Uh, prospects, not a client per se. Um, we did have a challenge of a project we thought was could be modern and all, and it was inside a historic district uh, that was a challenge because we had to change the facade change completely the style of the house and um, it was it, let me say I learned about it now I know where when to identify how to identify these historic districts or properties um, and when the prospects come in and they want to have a certain style um, you know, in the first 10 minutes, I clarify, you know, what society you want to look for because we only do these modern contemporary things. And they were, no, we're looking for more transitional, blah, blah, blah. Sorry, we're not a fit. And, you know, mm -hmm. call it a day. And some, mm -hmm. sometimes it hurts because, you know, it's going to be a big, amazing project. It could be a big, amazing project, but if they want. Uh, the last one that, that I had to say no to was... Um, can't remember. Can't remember the style, but it's like there's no way I'm gonna do details of that. I'm not set up for that. It was a birthday cake style. And... Do they ever come in with the birthday cake style? They're like, I want one that looks like no. a giant birthday cake, candles and frosting on it, and pink. <laughs> I mean, you can you can <laughs> no, you can have pink. I mean, happened. Legoretta was pretty nice, but I don't think he did frosting. That's never happened. Right. <laughs> That's good. No, it never happened. <laughs> Thank goodness. 
All right, Matias, so you have, I mean, you built something over the past few years that, that many new architecture firms would be envious of. You're on your, your way to great things. You talked about how the, the vision of the practice is, is being free of clients, meaning doing your own development projects. What's the, vi- what's the final vision here that you're shooting for? Is this like Jared De La Valle, you know? Uh, you're going to alloy architecture, do huge condominium products that you guys are the developers of, or is it more small scale? What's the vision? Got it. Um, no, we want to do, our vision is to go waterfront. Waterfront, single family properties. South Miami has such a big, South Miami, I mean, South Florida, not only Miami, Miami, Naples, um, Sarasota, all, all, all this South Miami areas has such a big market for those waterfront single family homes that look like mansions that you can have in modern styles that is what we're pointing to not saying that i I wouldn't do a multifamily um i'm it's it's been more i've I've been having some more opportunities there and you want to explore it but our big vision is our as our own developer firm and uh and you know this with the whole group basically is 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 that you know I don't know a couple of houses a year six every two months maybe that would be amazing um, what's your financial the, target you know, I mean being able them. to have a private jet in the future pulling down a million dollars a year what's the financial vision here <laughs> the, are you like Jonathan Siegel where you have a person. garage full of, of, of collectible cars and you're no, going to the tour de elegance in Pe- Pebble Beach yeah, although I like I like to design those homes, I wouldn't live in one of them. Uh, no, I I would like to have uh, my sailing team, team racing sailing team. Oh, nice! Um, you know, it's a it's a boat for four or five people at most, um, and enjoy and maybe have another more casual boat so I can take clients there and do some networking events. That would be amazing. Nice. And a nice 40, like a 40-foot hunter, a 40-foot, you know. What, are, are you talking yeah, like a Chris like Craft, that. like a, a cruiser boat or a sailboat? No, a sailboat. Sailboat. Yeah, All there time. you go. My so, man. That's my it man. Could be, you, yeah. It could be a, a mortar one, if depending where we live, if we can have it in the waterfront. And, you yeah. know, sail, sailboats can access everywhere. But, yep. uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah. That Very sense. Cool. Um and and travel a lot we i like to travel my wife mm. likes to travel uh, we want to be able to travel how much as much as possible and um yeah going out whenever we want to something things like that you know that's that's part of the vision that's my my vision board basically beautiful i love it so you have a vision board great you just reminded me. You got me. Got me thinking again. Uh, a couple of years ago, we chartered a sailboat because we, we used to live on a sailboat, do a lot of sailing. We chartered a sailboat from uh, Los Angeles over to Catalina Island and had all my kids on there. Actually, invited my sister on with some of her sons. Uh, we had eleven people on this Amazing. boat. It was a forty-foot boat. It had a lot of bunks in it. Um, but yeah, it was so cool because you know Catalina in a in a powerboat, Catalina to Los Angeles is just a couple hours of a trip across. If that sailboat, you know, it's going to take you five hours, but you really feel like you're like this explorer. You feel like you're like going into, yeah, you know, like the old school, you know, it's the sailing the seven seas. So that sounds like a fun vision. Sounds like it's great for your kids. Uh, your your wife is getting ready to. You're going to have birth here for another baby again pretty soon. By the time this airs, you will probably already be a father. So, yeah, we just love what you're doing, Matthias. You're crushing it, man, and uh, we look forward to keeping up. Thanks for coming here on the podcast. Thank you so much. It was pretty great, pretty entertaining too. Fun, at least for me. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me, Enoch. You're welcome. And that's a wrap. Oh yeah, one more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. And now a word from our sponsor, RCAT. Hey, Architect Nation, since you're a podcast listener, I know that you're always looking to fill up your empty space in your day with valuable ways to sharpen your sword as an architect or sharpen the saw, as Stephen R. Covey said. I wanted to tell you about Detailed, which is a podcast series run by RCAT that features architects, engineers, builders, and manufacturers where they share their insight and expertise as they highlight complex, interesting, and odd building conditions that they've encountered and the 
ingenuity it took to solve them. It's hosted by Sharice Lakeside, otherwise known as CSI Kraken, who's a senior specification writer at RDH Building Science. She uncovers lessons learned to help you navigate similar challenges that may arise in your projects. You can listen now by heading over to rcat.com forward slash podcast. That's A-R-C-A-T dot com forward slash podcast or search your favorite podcast app for detailed by RCAT. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.